When Victoria Sue went bankrupt, I married her. I protected her company through bankruptcy restructuring and made it to the rich list. But she said I took advantage of her vulnerability and destroyed her happiness. To retaliate against me, she announced her high-profile relationship with a young lover. And I was her unknown husband. Later, I attempted suicide, feeling hopeless, and divorced her. Yet, she cried her eyes out and knelt, begging me to come back to her. Chapter 1 The clock's hands slid to 12, and the meal on the dining table had already gone cold. Suppressing the nameless bitter emotions in my heart, I got up and returned to the bedroom to rest. Today is our wedding anniversary, and she still hasn't come home. She's probably spending the night with Joel now. Just as I turned around, the phone on the table rang. It was Victoria. I was surprised but quickly answered the call. Ben, at the Wish Hotel, private room 709. Her words were brief but very clear. A hotel private room, suitable for large anniversary events. My heart filled with joy, my voice cheerful, and I hurriedly replied, Okay, I'll be right there. MM. Chapter 2. Pushing open the private room door. I was stunned. I stared blankly at the noisy crowd and the banner in the room. The banner read in bold letters, Congratulations Joel for getting into a university for graduate school. Victoria and Joel were the stars of the show. Surrounded by everyone, my blood rushed to my head. Filled with the embarrassment and anger of being mocked, I looked at Victoria. Victoria simply held on to Joel, looking down at me with a slight smile. Look, look, he's here. Ha ha, I told you he would definitely come. Such a simp. Ha ha. She already has a boyfriend and he's still simping. A simp who ends up with nothing. Ha ha ha. The attendees were my classmates. A group of petty people who delighted in revealing others' wounds. I slammed the door and was about to leave the room. But I found the door had been locked. Seeing I wanted to leave, the group started to hold me back with ill intentions. Don't go. You're already here. Bro. We were just joking. You took it seriously. Come on. Have a few drinks. They pushed and pulled me back to my seat. In the struggle. Several glasses of strong liquor were poured down my throat. I always get drunk easily. Now I was feeling a bit lightheaded. I shook my head, trying to shake off the alcohol. When I looked up again, I found myself in my kitchen at home. The food on the dining table was completely cold. A chill ran through my heart, and I staggered towards Victoria, facing her puzzled and surprised expression. I frowned and asked, Do you remember today is our wedding anniversary? As I said this, my grievances surged up. I pointed at the cold meal and said with great resentment, I spent a long time learning to cook this, and it got cold waiting for you. Victoria's surprise turned into a playful smile. I frowned, not understanding why she was laughing. The next moment, a cup of cold water splashed on my face. The dining table, food, clock, all the scenes from home collapsed quickly. The banner, the noisy laughter, the furious Joel. These real scenes reminded me that I was still in the private room. Joel splashed another cup of cold water on me. The water flowed down my neck to my chest and back. Matching my dazed and shocked expression, making me look extremely pathetic. Benjamin, stay away from Vicky. Joel said coldly, if you keep imagining things about a woman who doesn't belong to you, I'll teach you a harsh lesson. Everyone burst into laughter, such a simp, even fantasizing about marrying her. I wanted to flee, but was held down in my seat, unable to move. Why are you in such a hurry to leave? We haven't had enough fun yet. Leaving, that would be disrespectful to us. I sat in the corner, praying for the party to end quickly. The group started playing truth or dare. Laughter and screams echoed from time to time. This time, Victoria was chosen, and her dare was to kiss him and present. My heart suddenly twisted in pain. I didn't want to see her kiss Joel. That would be like an execution for me. I kept my head down, not wanting to see. But the imagined cheers and applause didn't happen. The room fell into an eerie silence. A shadow loomed over me. How can you kiss with your head down? I looked up suddenly, only to see Victoria looking at me with a mocking expression. She lifted my face. Whispered in my ear so only the two of us could hear. Wedding anniversary. Make it up to you. Her intoxicating scent disturbed my already foggy mind. And I looked up. Waiting for that fragrant kiss. Ha. Huh. A sneer. Victoria threw away my hand and walked away with a light laugh. She turned around and passionately kissed Joel. Who fell into her embrace. I couldn't bear it anymore. Kicked open the door. And fled in disarray. Chapter 3. I think there was a time when Victoria and I were in love. We met at a campus dance. Our waltz steps were perfectly synchronized, just the two of us. After the dance, she hid in my arms, laughing heartily, pure and lively, stirring my heart. I noticed her. Later, we unexpectedly met again at an internal business meeting. We suddenly realized that the other person was the rumored heir who had just returned to the country. I was the heir of the Song family, and she was the heir of the Sue family. We were a perfect match, born for each other. Later, I began to pursue her. Her responses became more and more enthusiastic. We ate together, 
went shopping, exchanged gifts, and spent the whole day together on Valentine's Day. Everyone thought we would end up together, and so did I. So, on the day Victoria went bankrupt, I presented her with a contract and a list of assets, telling her that marrying me was her best option. I protected her company through bankruptcy restructuring. She stared at the thick contract for a long time. In the end, she signed countless times with trembling hands, her eyes red, cursing me, taking advantage of the situation, seizing power. Is this fun for you, Benjamin? On our wedding day, she told me expressionlessly that she didn't love me and that our marriage was just an alliance, each playing their own game. She suppressed the news of our marriage, but the next day, she publicly showed her love for Joel. I told myself it was okay, that once she had enough fun, she would come back. Chapter 4 A small cry woke me up. Wait, why is it a woman's voice? I opened my eyes abruptly. Next to the bed, there was a naked woman sitting and crying softly. This shocking scene hit me like a sledgehammer. No way. I lifted the quilt and saw that I was also naked. The woman, seeing I was awake, cried. Last night, you got drunk, and I took you to the hotel to rest. But as soon as we got to the hotel, you suddenly pounced on me, pressing me down, and then, boo-hoo, I held my head, trying hard to recall the events of last night. Last night, didn't I flee home in a hurry? No, that's not right. I never went home. That private room door was locked tightly by them. Seeing I wanted to leave, they repeatedly pressed me down into the seat. I drank glass after glass to drown my sorrows, feeling dizzy. The last memory I had was of a woman supporting me out of the private room. Benjamin, we were classmates, and yet you ruined my purity. I stared at her and asked, did we really? Last night. What else? I rubbed my temples, feeling irritated. How much money to shut you up? No amount of money can make up for my purity. Enough. I shouted sternly. How long are you going to play this trick? Such schemes are not even worth my attention. As the heir of the Song family, there are countless women trying to climb into my bed. This trick of a drunken one-night stand has been obsolete for centuries. I grabbed her chin, staring into her eyes. Do you know that men can't even get it up when they are drunk? I was dead drunk last night. How could I have had sex with you? If you want money, just name a price. Otherwise, get out. The woman hurriedly put on her clothes and fled the hotel in a panic. The scenes of last night's party gradually surfaced in my mind, and I sat dazed on the bed. After a long time, I got dressed and walked out of the room. As soon as I opened the door, I saw Victoria leaning against the wall, smoking, as if she had been waiting for me for a long time. Chapter 5 Why, do you like this kind of woman now? Victoria asked coldly, exhaling smoke. I stared at Joel next to her, with undisguised love bites on his neck. Joel was the only one who knew about my marriage to Victoria. Sometimes, watching his clumsy and amusing attempts to compete for her favor made me want to laugh. Feeling a surge of annoyance, I turned away, not wanting to look at her. Why? You can play with men, but I can't play with women. You were the one who said we should each play our own game. She stubbed out her cigarette and changed the subject. Do you know why I came to find you? I suddenly felt something was wrong. Victoria and I never knew each other's whereabouts. So how did she know I was in this hotel room? Victoria chuckled and threw her phone at me. See for yourself. I took the phone, my frown deepening. On the screen was a post made by that woman, explicitly naming and accusing me of forcing her. The accusation was vivid, full of details, and very graphic. Reading it made me want to kill myself. I opened my mouth to defend myself. Victoria snatched the phone back, her eyes full of disgust and disdain. Benjamin, do you really enjoy taking what you want by force? Wasn't taking me enough for you. Now you have to force respectable women too. My heart suddenly went cold, too lazy to explain. I strode forward without looking back and said, then let's get a divorce, I'll give you your freedom. As soon as the words left my mouth, even I was shocked, I couldn't believe that I had just suggested divorce. After all, we both knew that in this marriage, I was the humble one, the one trying to keep it together. Victoria was stunned for a moment, then sneered, what a joke, I'm not joking, we can divorce right now, I said firmly, I heard the sound of a phone shattering behind me. Victoria yelled angrily, divorce, don't even think about it. Chapter 6 I spent money to limit the spread of the post that slandered me, but the content was so sensational that many people shared and commented on it. More and more people found my phone number, and I received constant calls cursing me, filled with vile content. I knew I couldn't endure it any longer. I found the woman who had framed me and served her with a lawyer's letter. I informed her that the court session would start next month and that if she revealed the truth now, I might consider seeking a reduced sentence for her. The woman panicked and told me the whole truth. The more I listened, the deeper my frown became. Joel told you to do this. Yes, yes. The woman nodded frantically. He said if I took some bed photos with you and posted them online, he would give me $30,000. I thought, I thought it was just a small matter. 
I didn't expect it to lead to a criminal offense, Joel. I savored the name, wanting to chew it up and swallow it down. I stood up and said to the serious-looking lawyer, Lawyer Daniel, make sure the punishment is as severe as possible. Ignoring the woman's desperate cries behind me, I strode out of the negotiation room. Chapter 7 I sent the evidence and the lawyer's letter directly to Joel. I told him that unless he and the woman publicly posted the truth online and made a video apology, I would definitely take them to court. Two hours later, Victoria brought Joel to see me. Joel entered and immediately knelt down. Ben, I was just trying to play a joke on you. I'm sorry. Really sorry. I had no idea it would have such an impact. Please forgive me. Victoria pulled Joel up, saying tenderly, Don't kneel. Stand up. What can he do to you? I looked at the two of them coldly, watching their little performance. Victoria calmed Joel down and then frowned, ready to negotiate with me. Benjamin, do you know how much damage a lawyer's letter will do to Joel? If you really take him to court, he will be expelled. Do you know how hard he worked to get into graduate school? And what about me? I retorted. Does the harm done to me not count? What harm? She asked, surprised. You're a man. You won't suffer from such things. I couldn't help but laugh. I opened my messages and showed them to her. Rapist. Go die. Besides the abusive words, there were many terrifying pictures filled with curses against me. Seeing these messages, Victoria fell silent. After a long time, she took my hand gently. Just endure it for now. Joel worked so hard to get into graduate school. It wasn't easy for him to get into our school. And was it easy for me? I asked, feeling she was a stranger. We both worked hard to get into this school. Enduring so much hardship, doesn't my hard work count? I took out my phone and enlarged a photo to show her. Because of my reputation as a rapist, I was expelled. Victoria's face showed some hesitation. She gripped my hand tightly, forcing a smile. Ben, it doesn't matter if you're expelled. You're the heir of the Song family, with your own company and wealth. Even without this degree, you'll still be successful. But Joel came from a poor background. Without this degree, he will have nothing. I raised my hand to stop her. What does his misfortune have to do with me? He framed me first. Everything that has happened is his own fault. Why should I bear the consequences for him? Victoria's face showed a hint of anger. So, no matter what, you want to disgrace him and make him drop out. He has another option, prison. He can choose. I said without backing down. Either he publicly apologizes, or I take him to court. She pointed at me. Benjamin, you've got guts. Chapter 8. Joel's apology video eventually went online. Overnight, it became a trending topic. I thought this would clear my name. But people were no longer willing to listen to explanations. He's the heir of the Song family. Rich and powerful. Finding a scapegoat is easy. So pitiful. Forced to be a scapegoat. Just got into graduate school and forced to drop out. Sigh. What's wrong with this world? Comment after comment. All twisting the truth. Anyone with half a brain could tell who hired these trolls. I called Victoria directly. Did you hire those trolls? So what if I did? My hand tapping on the desk stopped abruptly. I never expected Victoria wouldn't even pretend anymore. She didn't know that those relentless abusive comments had driven me to the edge. Now I could only sleep with the help of sleeping pills. I was even diagnosed with moderate depression. After a moment of silence, I spoke wearily. No one wants to believe me. And I was expelled too. Are you done? Came the immediate response. I didn't know if she had genuinely forgotten or was pretending. This school was the same one we both worked hard to get into. Enduring so much to be admitted. To me. This school held the memories of our youth. I fell silent again, and after a long pause, I spoke tiredly. Victoria, let's get a divorce. This was the second time I had mentioned divorce. There was a long silence on the other end. I continued, saying everything I had been holding back. Since you already have someone you love, I'm willing to step aside. Being with you is exhausting. I don't want to compete for your favor or anxiously wait for the scraps of your affection. Let's pick a date and get divorced. There was another long silence. Finally. Victoria's weary voice came through. I don't agree. We'll discuss it in person when we have time. All right. In person. I rubbed my forehead and hung up the phone. Chapter 9. An assistant walked in and handed me some documents. Mr. Song. There's a business partner who wants to meet with you this afternoon. I tossed the folder aside. Annoyed. There are so many business partners. If they all wanted to meet me in person, would I still have time to handle my duties? The assistant awkwardly replied. This business partner brought a large overseas deal worth $5 billion. I paused. Okay. Schedule a meeting. Chapter 10. Looking at the young woman in front of me, smiling broadly, I couldn't believe she was the business partner who brought the $5 billion deal from overseas. I'm Lisa. Pleased to work with you. Pleased to work with you. I tried hard to ignore the overly enthusiastic look in her eyes and started reviewing the project proposal. Lisa, however, kept chatting nonstop, feeling helpless. I put the proposal away and smiled at her. 
MS, then. Can we focus on reviewing the project proposal first? She tilted her head, showing a disappointed yet hopeful expression. Mr. Song, you really are forgetful. Ah, have you forgotten me so quickly? I frowned, confused. Do we know each other? She sighed, took out a little bunny keychain from her bag, and waved it in front of me. Does this remind you of anything? I stared at the bunny, racking my brains, but came up with nothing. She sighed heavily. It's been five years, but I still remember. Five years ago, we met at a matchmaking event. I liked you a lot. And then, a blush rose on her face. Then, you rejected me. You said you already had someone you liked. I cried. And you gave me this little keychain to cheer me up. She put the bunny keychain back into her bag as if it were a treasure. I smiled helplessly. Five years ago. That's indeed a long time ago. Not for me. My feelings haven't changed in five years. I like you. And I'm going to pursue you again. Her words shocked everyone. I hurriedly covered her mouth. What are you talking about? She cheerfully removed my hand. I haven't forgotten you in five years. I came back to find you. Since you don't have a girlfriend, I'm going to pursue you. I smiled helplessly. You've got it all wrong. I'm already married. What? Her mouth dropped open in shock. I smiled and asked. Why would you think I don't have a girlfriend? She fumbled and nervously explained. People in love have a certain sweet aura around them. And there are many little details. She said a lot, but I zoned out. No wonder no one ever thought Victoria and I were a couple despite being secretly married. Maybe my smile was too bitter. And Lisa stopped her incessant talking. Embarrassed. Um, are you okay? I came back to my senses, looked up at her, and smiled slightly. I'm fine. Let's talk about the contract. Chapter 11. Victoria came home reeking of alcohol. I helped her onto the sofa and covered her with a blanket. Lie down first. I'll go make some hangover soup. As I turned, a hand suddenly gripped my sleeve tightly. Ben, we won't divorce. Her drunken voice was full of grievance and coquettishness. I stopped in my tracks. Drunk. Her body was soft and boneless. She clung to my stiff body. Her breath reeking of alcohol. Ben. We won't divorce. We'll stay together. Ben. Ben. She called my name over and over. Full of dependence and affection. I sat by her side. Gently stroking the hair on her forehead. Vicky. Why don't we divorce? You don't like me. And you have Joel now. I'm just your unknown husband. Divorcing me won't cause you any loss. Her heavy breathing stopped abruptly. I sighed softly and stood up. You haven't been drunk for too long. Your acting isn't convincing. When you're drunk, you only hold my face and kiss me. You don't speak logically. And this time, your divorce talk is too careless. Her hand gripping my sleeve tightened suddenly. I took off my shirt and covered her with it. If you still want to keep acting, then sleep well. Heh. She sneered, her face turning ashen as she sat up. Benjamin, I won't divorce you. Why? I asked, puzzled. Benjamin because I want you to be miserable forever. I want to use marriage to lock you away from any chance of happiness. I laughed, pulling a cigarette from under the sofa and lighting it. You play with men. I play with women. How can marriage restrict me? She patted my face and said, because I am your unforgettable first love. Even if I am moldy and rusty, I am still your unforgettable first love. I held her hand. If I remember correctly, I am also your first love and your unforgettable first love. You can cheat, but I can't. She was speechless for a moment. I smiled. Let's divorce. I'll give you a huge divorce settlement. You can live comfortably with that money. Benjamin. She was furious. Knocking a wine glass off the table and grabbing my collar. Shouting. Money. Money. Is everything money to you? Is it all about benefits? You married me for shares and now want to divorce me for benefits. Why are you always so rational? Can't you sweet talk me like other men? Are you crazy? I pushed her away. You're simply unreasonable. Get out. Victoria spat out the words through gritted teeth. Pointing to the door. I grabbed my coat and opened the door. A body suddenly lunged into my arms. Chapter 12. Lisa scratched her head and laughed. Seems like I came at a bad time. I pushed her away and strode toward the elevator. Eavesdropping isn't a good habit. Misunderstanding. Misunderstanding. She explained, pulling out a stack of documents and handing them to me. This contract is urgent, so I had to bring it to your home. I took it, opened the folder, and began to read carefully. These figures. Ben. Lisa interrupted. I plan to pursue you again. She looked at me, her eyes full of determination. I'll wait for you to divorce, then I'll pursue you. I won't give up like I did five years ago. Feeling helpless, I lifted the folder and patted her head, joking. All right, young lady, I'll wait for you to pursue me. She chuckled. A cold, abrupt voice echoed in the empty stairwell. Benjamin, so this is why you want a divorce. Victoria stood with her arms crossed, staring at me darkly, her eyes shifting between Lisa and me. If this is why you want a divorce then I disagree even more. She stepped forward, looking down at Lisa coldly. Little girl, rushing to be a mistress, don't you have any shame? Lisa retorted immediately. You, a cheater, 
are worse than a mistress. Seeing the two about to argue, I quickly pushed Lisa into the elevator and pressed the down button. Victoria grabbed me, stood on tiptoe to grip my collar, and asked angrily, cheating, get lost. I pushed her away, straightening my disheveled collar, equally angry, what right do you have to say that to me? Damn it, Benjamin, you have a wife, Victoria, did you ever think about having a husband when you were with Joel? I was so angry I was shaking, you cheating is justified, but if I do it, it's outrageous, you're so hypocritical, I am innocent with Joel. This made me laugh. So many blatant love declarations on social media, kissing in public, that's called innocence. I was too lazy to argue with her and turned to leave. As I turned, Joel stood there, tears streaming down his face, looking at Victoria in disbelief. I sneered, such innocence indeed. Chapter 13 I insisted on divorcing Victoria, but she stubbornly refused, leaving me frustrated and exhausted. Victoria, what will it take for you to agree to a divorce? Unless you die. A cold voice came from the other end of the line followed by the beeping of a hang-up. I sighed lightly and had just put down the phone when another call came in. Hello, Benjamin. Is this Mr. Benjamin? This is a city first hospital. Please come quickly. Mom. Mom. Dad. Dad. I cried hysterically, clinging to the coffin, not letting anyone approach. Mr. Song. Let go. If we don't bury them soon, we'll miss the auspicious time. No, I won't. I clung to the edge of the coffin, refusing to let go. Suddenly, a sharp pain shot through my arm and my consciousness slipped into darkness, the sedative has taken effect, take Mr. Song to the hospital, hurry and bury Mr. and Mrs. Song. My depression worsened, I could barely distinguish between reality and fantasy, in a daze, I seemed to see my parents standing in front of me again, mom, dad, you're back, I sniffed, feeling pitiful, Ben, don't be afraid, mom and dad will always be with you, but I can no longer feel your presence, I grabbed their clothes, the remaining scent almost gone, Ben, Remember the jade pendant mom gave you? It's our family heirloom. Do you still have it? I remember. I remember. I nodded frantically, like an obedient child. With it, mom and dad will always be by your side. Okay, I will find it. Chapter 14 In my memory, that jade pendant was placed in the bedside drawer at home. I returned home from the hospital and opened the door. In the living room, Joel was kneeling in front of Victoria. Sister Vicky, I don't want to break up. I'm willing to do anything as long as we don't break up. Victoria impatiently handed him a contract. Breakup fee. Five million. Sign it. No. I don't want it. I don't want it. Ignoring their melodramatic scene, I went to search the house. I turned the place upside down but couldn't find it anywhere. Ben, what exactly are you looking for? The jade pendant. My family heirloom jade pendant. Victoria frowned. The pure white bodhisattva one. I reached out. Yes. That one. Give it to me. She lowered her head, not looking at me, and asked, Is it very important? I replied irritably, yes, it's important, give it to me, Victoria came forward and hugged me, a very bad thought flashed through my mind, I started trembling all over, Ben, I'll find the best jade carver to make an identical one for you, I pushed her away, trembling, trying to suppress my breakdown, Victoria, what do you mean, she looked up, her eyes filled with guilt and caution, Ben, that jade pendant was lost a month ago, Joel said he liked it, so I gave it to him, later, he lost it. I really didn't know it was so important to you. Slap. A crisp slap echoed. Victoria's eyes were full of shock. My hand trembled as I slowly approached her neck. I imagined gripping her neck, tightening and tightening. Victoria, how could it not be important? I told you personally at our wedding that it was a family heirloom. I always kept it in the deepest part of the drawer. How did Joel see it? Victoria's voice began to tremble. Ben, let me explain. Victoria, I screamed, collapsing, tears falling like rain. Why did my parents die? Because you kept calling and bothering them while they were driving. If you didn't want a divorce, you should have come to me. Why bother them? Trying to persuade me not to divorce. Victoria, you've won. I covered my head, squatting in pain, screaming in despair. After a long time, I looked up and spoke firmly to Victoria. You said you'd only divorce me if I died. Fine, I'll go die now. In an instant, I rushed into the kitchen, grabbed a knife, and slashed at my neck with all my strength. In my last memory, I only remember the blood covering the floor and Victoria's frantic cries as she tried to stop the bleeding from my neck. Chapter 15 Victoria finally agreed to the divorce. After we walked out of the civil affairs office, I never saw her again. She said that as long as she was alive, she would never give up on reconciling with me. I just walked away without looking back. Lisa held my hand, carefully glancing at the heavy bandages around my neck, and handed me some documents. These hospitals all look good for treating severe depression. I didn't take them staring out the window at the rapidly passing trees, muttering, 
Find a hospital with the most trees. It was spring, and everything was coming back to life. I thought maybe I would too. I transferred to a suitable rehabilitation hospital, but the treatment wasn't effective, and my condition even worsened. Lisa began to doubt the hospital's competence and arranged for me to be transferred again. She pushed me through the lush garden, excitedly making plans for our recovery trip. I looked up, smiling at the young girl who stayed by my side. Lisa. My voice got stuck in my throat. I saw a fleeting figure among the trees, and I froze. What's wrong? She asked, puzzled. I shook my head. Nothing. Maybe I just so wrong. Oh. She kept pushing me forward without stopping. The gate was getting closer and closer. Stop. I shouted, startling her. What's wrong? I grabbed her hand, hurriedly saying, I think I saw Joel. Joel. She asked, confused. I nodded. She laughed, with a hint of cruelty. I'll have someone check right away if it's really him. Then things will get interesting. Chapter 16. After spending a long time with Lisa, I discovered that her personality wasn't as simple as it seemed. She was very cheerful, especially towards me, but in business, she was ruthless. She didn't hesitate to use underhanded tactics when necessary, just like now. In front of me were two people tied up and covered in blood. Ben. One is Joel. The other is his sister. They're twins. The person you saw in the hospital was his sister. She removed the gag from the person on the left and handed it to me. That person gasped for air, screaming. It was Joel. Joel made me do it. He said if I changed your medication dosage, you'd never get better. I personally pulled the gag out of Joel's mouth and asked softly, Joel, we have no enmity. Why are you doing this to me? Joel struggled like a fish out of water. Because I hate you. I hate that Vicky loves you. From the beginning, she's only seen me as a substitute, a tool to annoy you. I was so happy when you two divorced. I would never let you recover and rekindle your relationship with her. I gagged him again and remained silent for a long time. There's no chance for us. I stood up and walked out of the interrogation room, saying to Lisa, hand them over to Victoria. She'll know what to do. Lisa grabbed my hand, her eyes showing a hint of panic. You, are you going to forgive her? I smiled, lightly brushing her cute nose with my pinky. Young lady, you think too much. She was still flustered. Come abroad with me for treatment. Leave her completely behind. I smiled helplessly, stepping forward to hug her. Don't be jealous. Aren't we a couple? We need to give each other a sense of security. So, I'm willing to go abroad with you. Deal. Deal. Chapter 17. The plane slowly descended, and the high-rise buildings of a city gradually appeared on the horizon. After five years, I had returned. Lisa sat next to me, angrily flipping through a magazine. What the heck? Now they're writing about deep love. I rubbed her head, laughing. Why are you angry when I'm not? Let me read you what these marketing accounts are saying. Miss Sue kneels in public to beg for forgiveness. Who is the person she's begging? Miss Sue holds a press conference, revealing shocking secrets of the rehabilitation center. Victoria, heiress of the Sue family, with a net worth of tens of millions, still unmarried. What secrets is she hiding? I laughed out loud at her tone, leaning over to look at the so-called shocking secrets. The 10-page article, tens of thousands of words long, detailed the love-hate relationship between Victoria and me. After I left the country, Victoria went crazy, kneeling in public to beg me to come back. She even sent Joel to a mental hospital where he was tortured day and night. Upon learning that I was returning, she prepared meticulously to welcome her ex-husband. I raised an eyebrow, finding it amusing. Lisa tightly held my hand, saying, Do they think I'm dead, ignoring the real wife? I chuckled. All right, I'll show them who the real wife is. Chapter 18 At the airport, cameras and reporters were all focused on Lisa and me. Victoria stood in the center, holding a large bouquet of flowers, waiting for me. After five years, she had lost a lot of weight, and the look in her eyes was much more humble. Seeing Lisa and me holding hands tightly, a severe pain flashed in her eyes, but she still forced a bitter smile. Ben, I have a lot to say to you. I raised my hand to stop her, lifting my and Lisa's interlocked fingers high, and said, I know what you want to say, but there's no need. Lisa and I are back to get married. The wedding is in a week and everyone is welcome to attend. With that, I held Lisa's hand and walked out of the airport. Chapter 19. Victoria somehow got my phone number and sent me a video. I clicked on it, and it showed Joel being tortured. Ben, I took revenge on him. Will you forgive me? I shook my head and sighed softly. Perhaps, in this relationship, no one was completely right or wrong. I handed her an electronic invitation and said, you're welcome to attend my wedding. Then I blocked her number. Chapter 20. Victoria died committed suicide. She died the day after my wedding. She attended the wedding, but only watched from a corner, alone and lonely. I didn't see her at the wedding. I only found out from the media reports afterward. She died, and I didn't feel any sadness. I truly, no longer loved her at all. 